Well, good morning. Uh, can we just give a round of applause one more time for the Perkins family, the Cron family, and uh, yeah. There was, there was six families in the first service. The whole stage was filled up with families. And we're just so blessed uh, to see parents in a church committed uh, to our children and growing them up and raising them up in the faith of Jesus Christ. So uh, I got to start this morning with a confession. Some of you who know me well already know this, but I have an allegiance to two football teams. I know, right? This is like a sin, apparently. Even if they're in different conferences, it does not matter. I, I have loved the Philadelphia Eagles for a long time, uh, but I have come in living here in Rochester in the Buffalo area for 15 years, I have come to be a big Bills fan. Yeah, see? See, that's the thing. Bill's, Bill's Mafia is an inclusive group, and I have, I have appreciated it. They got, the, they got the blue collar, work hard. Like, I love everything about it. And I get criticized because it's like, oh, you jumped on now that they're good. And I mean, not right now, but they have been good. Uh, you know, so like, come on, you know. And I, and I get that. I will say I, I jumped on the bandwagon the year that my Eagles won the Super Bowl. So that's my little defense. You can believe it or not. I'm trying not to lie today in the house of the Lord. But, uh, you know, I, I love watching football. And my favorite play in football is the Hail Mary. At the end of a game where uh, basically it, everything comes down to one play. You've been watching for three hours, but it really just comes down to whether this team is going to catch this ball or not. It's a low percentage play, but it's very exciting. Like you're always on, on the edge of your seat if you're into the game waiting for this moment. And what they call this, is, so it, what the play is, is that the quarterback steps back and literally just throws it basically as far as they can to try to get it to the end zone. If you catch it, you win in most scenarios, like if you, if you get more points. If not, you lose. You go home sad, crying. <laughs> That's your day. And so what they call that is it's like this heave of desperation. And this morning, I, I want to talk to you for a minute about desperation. Have you been in places, not like a, you know, seemingly meanest, meaningless football game, but something that means a lot to you, where you felt desperate. You felt like God's got to come through, or I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've been there in my own life, and maybe you're there, or maybe you've been there. But I can tell you that the, the story that we're going to look at today from Exodus chapter 16 is all about a people who were living in complete desperation of God. We're in a series of teachings uh, looking at the life of Moses, and I'll give you a little context for it. So we're in about 1500 BC, and uh, basically this group of uh, Israelites or Hebrews, they have been through insane amounts of trauma. So they go, this group of people goes 400 years under the tyranny of slavery. I mean, think about how old you are and then multiply that by however long. Like, think how long that would be with your friends, your family, with everybody all around you, your whole community is living in slavery under the Egyptian rule, under Pharaoh. And so God wants badly to free them. And so he sends plague after plague to try to get the leader to change his mind. Finally, they do get freed and they're celebrating. They're retreating away. And then the Egyptians come after them again and they've got their backs up against the wall. They're about to be murdered when God does another miracle and he splits apart the Red Sea and this group of Israelites walk across on dry ground. They get to the other side and then as their enemies are closing in on them, the waters come down and the Hebrew people are rescued. It's another miracle that God provides for his people. Not, not only this, so they, they get to the other side and, and it kind of feels like, hey, this has got to be like, the end of the story, like they're good. They're finally free. They're away. Like it's good. It feels like the ending to the story, but the truth is it's, it's still a middle point within their journey because now they get to the other side of the Red Sea and they end up in the desert in the middle of the Middle East. It's super hot. They've got no food. They've got no water. They've got no jobs. And all this humongous group of people start getting really upset 
with their leader. They even say it would be better for us with how hungry and starving and how horrible this is. We'd rather go back to living as lives of slaves than living how we're living right now. So you can imagine what it's like to be all the people who are suffering and their children don't have food. And you can imagine what it's like to be the leader, Moses, when he's caught. Like, I followed what God had for me. And now I'm in this desperate moment where I, I feel like I've followed after God, but it doesn't seem to be going well. That's the place that we find ourselves in today. So I am going to actually invite Amy Alquist out to be our reader of our text today. She would not like me to share this, but she was Henrietta Woman of the Year. Give it up for her. <laughs> She did say uh, she's looking forward to some words with me later. So I don't know what those are. But all right, let's, uh, if you can read the text for us, I'd appreciate that. Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse two. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Pause. The next few verses share that the Hebrew people complain a lot to Moses, Aaron, and God, but God wants them to know that he hears their grumbling and answers their cries. Verse 13, that evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer, about three pounds worth for each person that you have in your tent. Thank you, Amy. So, I don't know about you, but have you ever seen that like super uh, cheesy Christian artwork? It feels like it's, it's like watercolors. It ends up in a coffee mug. It's in the back of your cupboard. And it says something like, trust in God. And it's, it's some phrase that actually has some real significant meaning, but for us has almost become kind of like noise and we, we don't really think about it. We just kind of like say it or we know it's right, but, but what, does it, what does it really mean? It's almost like a, a phrase like that, trusting God. It, it can become this like spiritual cliche rather than a truth that we live out. So what does it mean for you and for me to actually trust in God? How does that work in today's world? Well, um, what I can tell you is I, I want to put some like practical legs to this. And so uh, think about it in your human relationships. If you trust somebody, you, two things are true about that. The first is that the person you believe is capable of doing something. And second, that they're going to follow through on it. So if I hire somebody to fix a leak on my roof, I believe that they're capable of doing that job, and I believe that they're going to do that job and follow through on it, and therefore my house isn't going to get all damaged and ruined. I trust that worker on my house to get it done. So when we say, I trust in God, what we are saying is this. We're saying, I trust that God loves me. I trust that God has forgiven me. I trust that God hears my prayers. I trust that God is going to meet my deepest needs, needs in my darkest hour, just like he did for the Hebrew people so many years ago. He is the same God that he will do that for me too. 
He will walk with me in the midst of my pain. You see, we can just throw out a phrase like trust in God and it can start to lose its meaning over time. But it is significant for us when we are in our desperation moments. It's key for us. Now, the, the truth is, when we think about who God is, if we're going to trust in him, we have to believe that he is capable and he's going to follow through. And I think there's this real tension point that can happen for us and why we stop, end up trusting in God. And that is that we, we pray a prayer and we, we are praying that this outcome will happen as a result of our prayer. And then it doesn't go exactly that way. And the truth is, is that prayer is a mystery. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer is important and prayer moves the heart of God. It's, it's super important. And we have to trust that God will provide, but we also have to note that it's not going to happen on your terms and your conditions. If we, if we try to operate in that way, we're going to get let down because ultimately when, when we believe that I get to dictate the terms of the conditions, ultimately I'm the one who becomes God. I'm the one who's calling the shots. I've got a news flash for you. You and I aren't the center of the world. <laughs> it, we, we just, we, we aren't. And you know, I think sometimes we can have this belief that we would never say out loud, but it's like, God is almost like our spiritual Santa Claus. I know so you're not supposed to say Santa Claus in church, just like against Christians or something. I don't know. But it's like, like God is this spiritual Santa Claus. And so you, you sit on his lap and you're going to get the first five items on your list. And, and of course, nobody would overtly say that or believe that. But here's how it looks like for us. It's like, God, I have been faithful. I have been obedient. I made the hard choice when my back was up against the wall. And therefore, God, you should do this. It's like God owes us this outcome as if we can see the whole scope of everything. And again, we'd never say that, but it is how we start to operate. And it's part of why we start to erode our trust in God is because we're not playing this all the way out. So for the Israelites, they're in this spot where they've got this life or death situation. But for you and for me, maybe you've faced some like real life or death situations. Or maybe there's somebody that you love and you care about who is facing it right now. And you're praying and you're asking for the miracle again and again, every morning, every night. You see, we can, we can have conversations like this and it sounds theoretical until we're in the midst of the storm or we're in the midst of our desert. And it feels like we're out here wandering for days and days and days. And sometimes for you and for me, we don't get the exact miracle we are asking for. But I will tell you this, just like God provided the manna and the other things that the Hebrew people needed, he does the same for you and me when we are in the middle of our desert. God provides miracles like enough strength for you to just get out of bed in the morning and put one foot in front of the other. And sometimes I know that's all you can do and that's okay, but God's going to give you that strength or he gives you people around you, a community that can build you up. That's a gift from God. Or maybe for you, it's that, that financial, that practical provision that he provides a miracle in that way for you. I, it's, it's a miracle every day that we are unfaithful to God, but he never leaves our side and is never unfaithful to us. Like that's, that's great news for you and for me. And so we're not going to always get the exact outcome we pray for. And I know that when we're in the middle of this, this is a really, this is difficult for us to process and difficult for us to hang on. But this is part of the gift of this scripture is it reminds us that even for people who didn't have food, water, jobs, purpose, any of it, God heard their cries and he responded by giving them what they needed. 
It likely wasn't everything they had asked for in the exact way they had asked for it, but he was faithful. And the truth about God is he is always faithful. If you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. amen. So uh, we pick up in our story in Exodus chapter 16 still. This is now verse number 21. It says this, each morning, everyone gathered as much manna as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until the morning. Now the next seven or so verses go on to talk more about the Sabbath, about how uh, they, they tried, some of them like try to get more than they were supposed to. They try to store it up for the next day, even though God had said not to do that. And then like maggots come and eat it and it doesn't work. And then some of them go out on the seventh day and they're out there looking, even though God said it's not gonna be there, they still go out and look. Like, so even in the midst of God doing this incredible miracle, which like, I'm like, can we think about this for a minute? Can you imagine like you go outside in your grass every morning and there's like dew and it like turns into this like bread like thing? <laughs> like that would be pretty cool. But then I'm also like, I'd probably be like that. I'd probably start grumbling too. I'd be like, eh, can, we, can we get some steak out here too? Like I, I need a little variety too, you know? Uh, my vegetables that I eat, you know? Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, and so what's, what's interesting is that built into God's answer for his provision is this call for them to take the Sabbath. And I find this interesting because it's like they're in the middle of like crisis and God is talking to them about the Sabbath. So maybe for you, you have followed the Sabbath like every week for as long as you've lived. And maybe for you, you're like, I don't even know what that word means that you're talking about, Pastor. Well, let me tell you, the Sabbath uh, comes first in scripture when uh, God creates the whole world. It's in the Genesis account where uh, he, he creates the whole world in six days. And it says on the seventh day, God rested. And then he said his creation was very good. And so now there's this group of Hebrew people and he is inviting them to take a day of rest. Even in the midst of like a ridiculous crisis struggle season, even though they are just newly freed slaves and, and they struggle with it. They don't do it perfectly well. And I think the truth is for many of us, it's a, it's a struggle in this room. And, and I'll be honest with you right now. It's been a struggle for me at seasons in my life as well to not live this out perfectly consistently in my own life. And I think, I think about this. Have you ever noticed that the Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that will get praised for breaking it? Like, You'll, you'll climb the ladder faster because you'll work harder. You'll, you'll get more done and you'll get uh, recognition after recognition for not following after God's wisdom. It can even happen if you're a minister. It's, it's true. And so why do the Hebrew people struggle with it, with the Sabbath? And why do we struggle with the Sabbath? Well, I've got two insights I want to pull from, from this text that I think it teaches us. And, and the first is this, is that ultimately I think that we trust ourselves to solve the problem more than we trust God through my problem. Have you ever been there? Because for the ancient Hebrews, they're worried about their survival. But for you and for me, you know, we're, we're looking at it like, hey, I go to church most Sundays, but like, pastor, you know how much stuff I have left to get done before Monday comes? Do you, do you know how long that to-do list is? Like, I've got five hours of work ahead of me right after I get out of here. I'm really hoping there's a bagel still left so I can grab like one on the road so I can get going on this task list. <laughs> and here's, here's what I think is interesting for us to help get us back on track and get our hearts following after God's best for us. I think we need to return back to that 
that definition of trust we talked about earlier. Trust is that God is capable, we believe somebody is capable, and that they're going to come through. And in the scenarios where we just feel like we've got too much to do, so we can't take the Sabbath, what are we really saying? We're really saying, I don't trust God's way, I trust in me. My, my way is actually better than God's. Like, my, way, my, my situation is different, so it doesn't really apply to me. I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that that's the case. And, and I will say this, like, there can be nuances to this. Like, if you're a, you know, a doctor in clinicals, you got to work seven days. Like, I get that there, there are some nuances to this. And that's where I would say is like, that's the beauty of, and the gift of being in community. Like, sometimes we need to dialogue about how this actually works. But we got to be careful that what we call a season does not become a pattern for our living long term. It's too easy for that to happen. So the second reason that I think that we struggle with implementing the Sabbath is very similar to the first. And it is this, that I trust my way of living more than I trust God's wisdom. And I know that none of you in this room would verbally say that out loud verbatim. But sometimes I think our lives say that louder than our mouths do. And I, I don't say any of this with judgment. I say all of this out of care and out of a vision for your life that could be so much greater if we were to lean into this today. So maybe for you, you're sitting there and you're like, all right, I hear you. I want to I wanna implement the Sabbath, but like I, I legitimately have too much to get done before the, the weekend comes and I, I don't know what to do. So let's talk about it. I think the, the first thing I, I think about that can be our hurdle is our, just our schedules. Like the way that our culture is set up, it doesn't just lend itself to a day off. And the truth is, is that like, we just have too much to get done. Like somebody's got to take care of the house and somebody's got to do the laundry and somebody's got to do the dishes and somebody's got to cook and somebody's got to take the kids over to this and somebody like, and oh, and there's jobs and there's, and it just becomes like this blur of days from morning until night that are just so, so full. So what I can tell you is that the way that this has worked out for me and my family is it's worked out a little bit different and we've had to play around with it. So my wife works full time as a teacher. So her schedule is like pretty normal and set. Monday to Friday, um, she works. And on Saturdays, she kind of gets her responsibilities done and she works really hard to get all of her stuff done. And then come Sunday, she does no work. Like that bathroom ain't getting cleaned. Like it's, it's gonna be how it's gonna be until the next day and we're gonna live. Even if people are coming over, sorry, <laughs> good luck to you. <laughs> like that's, that's how it's gonna be. But, uh, and actually my kids have done the same thing. And at first they, they were not fans of it, but now they look forward to it. That it's a full day of rest and enjoyment for their souls. I don't even think they can articulate that fully yet, but I know that they look forward to it. Now for me, um, my days off are Saturdays and Mondays. And so originally I would take my Sabbath on a Monday, but there's a problem because I'm an extrovert and everybody goes to work on Mondays. <laughs> Nobody wanted to call off work to go golfing with me. <laughs> so I had to get a little bit creative with it. And I've had to kind of flex what that looks like for me in different seasons of my life. Right now for me, it's, it's a Friday night to a Saturday night. So even yesterday, I was tempted to be like, hey, I kind of want to work on this talk. But I was like, how ironic would it be if I broke my Sabbath to teach about the Sabbath? <laughs> so thank God I didn't do it there. But in, instead for me, it's like I, I have like all of this enjoyment time. Like we, on every Friday night, we do our family watch, it gets pizza, we make cookies, we watch a movie. Like it's something we all look forward to. There's this rejuvenation time for me and for my soul. But what I had to learn is I had to get flexible with it. It didn't look the same for me as it looked for somebody else. And maybe that's true for you. Maybe your job isn't consistent. And so it's got to be a little flexible. The point is not to become religious about this. The point is to be faithful. Okay? Because I believe that obedience for you and for me 
always is a blessing. It's always a blessing for us. And I, I think that's part of the value of being in church and being in community is we're reminded of the truth of what that obedience does in our hearts and in our lives over the course of time. I think it's super helpful for us. The other thing that was a barrier for me, and maybe it is for you, is I used to believe that the Sabbath was just boring. It, it was like, well, you get up, you go to church, and it's just kind of like you, you sit and you're quiet and you read your Bible for, you know, just a quick 18 hours of the day. <laughs> maybe you could take a food break <laughs> if God allows for it. And of course, I, I didn't fully think that, but honestly, for me as somebody who's extroverted, who like wanted to like have like great food on that day and just like enjoy time with friends and family and all of this, I, I struggle with it because I didn't have a great vision of what a Sabbath was. And so maybe for you today, it's like, man, a day just sitting in peace and quiet sounds like the greatest gift from God. And for me, I'm like, mm. <laughs> I, I can do that for a little bit, but I, I cannot do that all day long. So I want to I want to paint a picture of a, a bigger vision of what Sabbath can be. And uh, this is taking from uh, adapted from the teachings of Dr. Timothy Keller, a pastor. Um, and this is what he shared to celebrate your Sabbath. Well, I'm going to fly through these points, but they're important. So I want to let you uh, let them get into your heart. So the first is this a vocational rest. What this looks like is something that's not your job but that you just really enjoy. So for me, this is mowing my grass. I, I love a nice fresh cut out there. Like my family literally like makes fun of me because they're like, you're on hour four of taking care of this grass. And I'm like, shut up kid, get inside, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, I don't say that. <laughs> but I, you know, for me, I, I love it. I love, I love getting rid of all the weeds. I love how it looks. I love like being out in God's creation in that way. That's part of, for me, is my avocational rest. And I used to think, oh, I couldn't mow the grass because that's work, but it doesn't feel like work for me. It feels like rejuvenation for me. That was the distinction I had to make. Laundry feels like work to me. I'm not doing that on my Sabbath, <laughs> okay? Second thing is this, contemplative rest. This is really time spent with God. And I think if we miss this piece altogether, we do miss out on a huge component of the gift of the Sabbath. That is prayer, that is worship, that is being in community, that's church. Like that is what this is. Third way that we can enjoy our Sabbath is through recre recreational rest. This would be things like sports or hikes. For me, this is golf and basketball. Fourth thing that, that makes for a more holistic Sabbath is our aesthetic rest. Some of you guys love this one. It's nature, it's art, it's music. For me, this is a stroll around Black Creek Park. Like that's where, that's where I'm gonna get that aesthetic rest for my heart and for my soul. And I, and I know I mentioned this earlier about myself, but I want to make sure you're thinking about this too. As you're setting up your Sabbath, as you're, as you're painting what that looks like, know thyself and know whether you are somebody who is, who leans more introverted, who leans more extroverted. Like, what do you need to help fill your cup? This is the vision of the Sabbath that God is giving us. It's a gift, not an assignment, a religious task for you to check mark. And that's always my worry in like giving you even a list. It's like, oh, well, let me make sure I get everything right. And it, the, the, again, the, the point is not just to check things off. The point is for us to have a full Sabbath, enjoying God and enjoying his creation. Dr. Timothy Keller adds this. He says, the purpose of Sabbath is not simply to rejuvenate yourself in order to do more production nor is it the pursuit of pleasure. The purpose of Sabbath is to enjoy your God, to enjoy life in general, what you have accomplished in the world through his help and the freedom you have in the gospel, the freedom from slavery to any material object or human expectation. I'll invite the worship team up. And here's what, here's what I want you to, to think about. We've got a culture and we've got a world that is overworked, and overstressed, your employer likely is not going to implement this for you. 
following through on the Sabbath takes an intentional plan throughout our week. But I will tell you that God's vision for this is worth it. He has a gift for you and for me. And I believe our world is exhausted and they're craving rest. My goodness, how we need rest in our lives. So I'm gonna invite you to bow your head and close your eyes this morning. And I just, I wanna encourage you this morning. We started by talking about placing our trust in God, that he is a God of provision, the God who cares, the God who saw the Hebrew people and the God who responded to the Hebrew people. And I want you to know that if you are in the middle of your desert, God is faithful and God sees you and God hears you and God is walking with you. And second, God is encouraging us, even in the midst of whatever we are walking through, he is inviting us to a more fuller Sabbath vision that he has for you and for me. I love the way that Jesus talks about this. In Matthew chapter 11, he says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus, would you come? Would you be enough for us? Would you help us to trust in your ways? Would you help us to implement your ways in our hearts and in our lives? Even when it's hard, even when we don't see the full picture, but to walk more fully in trust of you. Lord, would you allow us to find rest fully in you? Not in our own accomplishments, not in what we bring to the table, but what you have already done for us. God, help us avoid the temptation of becoming slaves to our own labor and instead to enjoy the fruits of our labor that you have given to us. Everyone who wanted that to be true for your heart and your life, would you say amen? Amen. Would you stand with us and let's respond this morning by singing and celebrating a God who has provided for the Hebrews and for us here today. Let's sing it out.